All right, well, I got 20 till time to start. Glad you all are here this morning. Good to be together in the house of the Lord. And I'm grateful that we didn't get what they predicted last night as far as snow. I don't think anybody really knew. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, y'all probably noticed the mattresses on the side of the building. That, that's not ours. Um, we've had a homeless person, looks like, try to move in uh, last night. And so we're going to take care of that after worship today. But uh, anyway, I think Charles and I are going to try to carry it between the two buildings so we can get it thrown out. If you want to wear a pair of gloves and help us move those mattresses, you're more than welcome to help us. Uh, I am excited about uh, our children's and youth pro programming resuming uh, in March. And uh, you saw Jenny's post uh, on our, our members page uh, on, the, on the 14th. Uh, the WMU is, is driving a really a, a reach out campaign to try to reach out to the kids. They haven't been on, the kids have not been on campus uh, since October. And so uh, we want to try to re-engage them. And so on each Wednesday night during the month of February, uh, we're going to give them a, a, a goodie bag. And the goodie bag is going to be a, a food item of some kind, a, an activity of some sort, and then some spiritual literature uh, to encourage them to be, you know, to get familiar again with being back on campus. And, but we're asking for your help and assistance in accomplishing this and asking you to make some financial donations uh, to uh, South Jefferson Baptist Church. But on the four line, right, WMU Project, and that way, th that money will go to them, and they're going to WMU is going to put together uh, those goodie bags, and then we'll distribute those uh, on Wednesday nights uh, to the children and youth uh, in our area. So we're excited that, that children's programming and youth programming is going to resume in October, and just a way to kind of uh, relight the fires in those kids. So anyway, glad you're here this morning. Let's stand together. We'll have a word of prayer. This is Brandon's last Sunday with him. Let's give him a hand. We've enjoyed you. You've been a blessing to us, brother. And uh, Jacqueline will be back uh, this Wednesday off of maternity leave, uh, good Lord willing. So, uh, And then she'll be back to fulfilling her duties next Sunday uh, here and leading us in worship. But we are grateful for Brandon, for his talent, uh, for his insights that he's brought to us, and uh, grateful for you, brother. Pray God blesses you. You are a, an apologetics major, is that correct? At Southern? He's uh, studying, studying apologetics at Southern and teaches music at uh, Whitfield Academy, so uh, we're grateful for you and pray God's blessings upon your ministry. Let's join together in prayer uh, this morning. Father, we thank you for grace and for mercy. Lord, thank you for uh, Brandon's uh, call and gifts and talents that you have blessed him with. And Lord, ask that you would uh, continue to bless him as he uh, pursues an education in apologetics and pray that his mind and heart will be opened by you and, and receive all that you have for him. Lord, bless his teaching and his ministry. Father, we invite you today and this morning into uh, our midst, Father, to speak to our hearts, to our minds, to mold us, make us into the children that you'd have us to be. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to gather and worship. We praise and lift high the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's his name that we pray. Try and wave to each other this morning. Good to see you in God's house. Right, good morning. Glad to be with y'all again. Uh, Brother Richard's been preaching the past couple of Sundays about victory. Um, and it just reminded me of Romans 8.31 where Paul tells us, If God is for us, then who will be against us? So will y'all stand this morning? We're going to sing, Whom Shall I Fear? He is 
is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. My strength is in your name, for you alone can save. You will deliver me. Yours is a victory. Whom shall I?
verse one more time, just the voices. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He hung me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. Y'all can be seated. Join me in Joshua chapter 1 this morning. Joshua chapter 1. We uh, wrap up uh, this series on victory in 2021 uh, today. And this will be the last one. But next Sunday we'll start, uh, we're going to preach through uh, 1 John. And next Sunday we'll be in 1 John. So I encourage you to go read that, that first chapter of 1 John. And it's an exciting book. And uh, a great letter, great epistle for us to read and understand. Really kind of working our hearts and minds toward Easter in, in preparation for our, our Easter preaching, so that's what we're, where we'll be going. This past Wednesday, we began uh, working our way through Romans, and so 
I invite you to read in Romans chapter 1, uh, at verse 17 and forward, uh, in preparation for Wednesday, but we're uh, having a good time there uh, discovering what the Word of God has for us. You know, we all want victory. We, we want to win. We, we want to know that everything is going to turn out uh, all right in the end. And that's something that we all want. We want it for our families, we want it for our friends, we want it for our homes, for our church, for our nation, for our, our state. And really, this is the promise that God gives to the nation of Israel as they're about to go into the promised land. Uh, Moses ha has gone on to be with the Lord, and Joshua is at the helm now. And, and God wanted the nation of Israel to be successful in this new venture of moving into the promised land and conquering it. He wanted them to be victorious. And as we read accounts like this, I want us to find ourselves in this account because certainly God wants the same for all his children. He wants us to be successful. He wants us to have victory in our lives, and he wants us to live victoriously in the life that we are now living today. That's why he gives us accounts like this, because we can look in and understand what God's expectations are of us, and as we read about God's expectations for his children, we can also learn and come to understand what we can expect from God as we abide by his expectations. And so today is a beautiful demonstration about how God designs and plans for his children to have victory. Now there are some things we need to understand about victory, and we certainly all want to have victory, but the, just the concept of victory carries with it the idea and the understanding that you can only have victory if there's something to be overcome. That if there's some kind of obstacle in our path, and, and the idea of victory implies that there's some kind of opposition waiting for us. And if we want to have victory, then we will have to overcome that opposition. If we don't overcome the opposition, then we won't have victory. And victory becomes ours as we defeat or overcome someone or something that's opposing us. If there's no opposition, if there's nothing to overcome, then victory cannot happen. So just by saying and, uh, and voicing that we want to have victory in 2021 in our lives, and not just this year, but the years following, we're also expressing the understanding that there's going to be some opposition. There's going to be some obstacles to overcome along the way. Certainly there will be mountains, but there will also be valleys, and we'll need to navigate both of those. Victory implies that if we think about the concept of victory, it carries with it the implication that there's a better way to be living life than how we are currently living today. And your life might be wonderful. And I hope that it is. But it can always be better in the Lord. It can always be uh, more fruitful in the Lord. And there's a, a place greater than where we are finding ourselves today. We can have greater relationships with our families. Our walks and talks with the Lord can be at a greater level. Our church can uh, attempt and do and accomplish greater ministries for our Lord and for His kingdom. We can live at greater levels of personal purity. I mean, we can live with a, a greater expression of love, Christian love in our life. And the list goes, list goes on and on of things that we can do at a, at a greater level. If there wasn't a better way of living, then there could be no victory. The concept of victory also implies that there are battles to be fought. And we understand that everything that's worthwhile has something blocking its access. Whether it's education, job, home, cars, there's something blocking the access to that, uh, that better thing, that greater thing. And the greatest opportunities, the greatest joys, the, the greatest goals require sacrificial effort on our part to get there. And so if we want to have victory in 2021, we understand that there are going to be some battles that we will need to fight. Some of them will be personal. Some of them will be physical in nature, health-related. Some will be financial. Some will be relational. But there will be battles to be fought because every day that we live life, there's an enemy out there seeking those whom he may devour. And he intends for us not to have victory this year or any year after this year. And so we understand that there will be victories. And a better life is worthwhile. It's worth battling for. And that's why God teaches his children to strive for victory. He's really laying out for Joshua and the nation of Israel an understanding of what victory is and how to accomplish it. 
Victory implies that there must be engagement with that opposition, with that barrier, but the battle will end in triumph as God's children. Now, God speaking to Joshua, he uses the word success. And success is characterized by victory. What was available to Joshua is available to each of us if we're willing to make the effort. And so I'm challenging us that in this coming year to make every effort to have victory. Victory in your life, victory in your family's life, victory in the life of our church. Things are going to change this year. I mean, our worship services are on an abbreviated schedule because everyone's wearing a mask. We don't have offering. We don't have children's sermon. We've cut the music back. We don't sing as many verses of songs. I mean, we've gone from an hour and 40-minute worship service to we try to hold it to 50, 45 or 50 minutes. We've made some changes because of COVID-19. Our Wednesday evening schedule completely eliminated the youth and children. Thank God that's resuming. We did that test in October, and it proved to be successful. We learned what to do and what not to do to engage our children. And I'm grateful that it's resuming. I'm grateful that, that WMU is driving a project for February to re-engage our children and youth. Our Wednesday evening worship schedule is abbreviated. Uh, it's only 45 minutes long now instead of, uh, instead of an hour. And so I'm grateful that in the course of this year, as uh, the vaccines become available widespread, Steph and I were talking this morning, do you think that we will ever be able to worship without our masks on again? And for most of us, we will. But I heard on the news and, and have read articles that, that there are some people that will probably wear a mask the rest of their lives. And that's okay, too. But we as a church, as a congregation, we want to re-engage our community, our culture in meaningful and effective ways for Jesus Christ. And I know that you want that in your families. It's going to be hard to get people back into the sanctuary, not just in our church, but across the board. For one, we've become lazy in a lot of ways. We enjoy staying home. I didn't know what came on television on Wednesday nights until we dismissed for coronavirus. I mean, I... I knew U of L always played on Wednesday, and I never got to watch the games. But other than that, I didn't know what Wednesday night television was. And I like it. When Wednesday nights resumed last week, I told Stephanie, I'm going to miss this program. <laughs> it's going to be tough. And so I'm asking us in this series of sermons to make conscious, calculated decisions to re-engage and choose to be victorious as a people of God, as a person of God, but also as a congregation. We've got a lost and dying world around us. There are people every day are dying in our community, and most of those are probably on their way to hell because narrow is the gate that leads to life and wide is the gate that leads to destruction. And we want to engage those people in meaningful ways. Now, there's a journey that lies before us as individuals, as children of God, but also as a church. And each of our journeys has been designed by God. The master craftsman has charted a course for our lives. And occasionally we'll take a detour and God will do all that he can while we're on these detours to get us back on the path that he's designed for our life. And what's great about all this, though, is that, that we really we get to choose our life's journey in the direction that it takes. We don't have to rely upon someone else to accomplish our successes for us. We get to do that ourselves. God grants you the opportunity to make choices and decisions about your life and the direction and the ebb and flow of your life. And so you don't have to wonder if somebody else is going to come through for you because you get to make that choice. We get to make that choice. And I'm asking you to make that choice today. We weren't able to choose how our life began, but we can greatly influence how our life unfolds. And that's wonderful when we begin to understand that God has given us that opportunity to impact the unfolding of our life. And, and so why not give our life the opportunity to unfold like a, a butterfly coming out of a, out of a cocoon? Joshua and, and Joshua and the Israelites were given this same awesome opportunity. This conversation that God has with, with Joshua is really instructional to him about how to engage, about how to have victory, and how to influence how the nation of Israel, how their corporate life unfolded. 
And God's giving this to them. They were empowered to choose the unfolding of their life's journey. It wasn't always going to be easy. There were going to be battles to be fought, valleys to traverse, mountains to climb. Sometimes for the nation of Israel, it would be real scary. Just like it is for us sometimes. We have high points in life. We have low points in life. We press on. So look with me into the tent where Joshua is seated. God's message to Joshua really became God, Joshua's message to Israel so that they could understand, folks, the choice is really ours. And it's all laid out there before us. And God's got a really a simple plan to help us navigate. That same message has become ours today. And I challenge you to embrace it. Listen in on this conversation with God, and together we'll learn how God designed the plan for the nation of Israel to have success and victory. And we can apply this to our own life so that we might have success and victory. Join me in Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, as we close out this series of sermons. God, speaking to Joshua, said, Joshua, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I want you to see what's happening here. God is laying out some expectations for the nation of Israel. And these really are like mind-boggling expectations. And in putting these expectations out before the nation of Israel, God's telling them what he expects, but he's also telling them what they can anticipate in return. It's both sides of the coin. This is what I expect from you. If you will fulfill what I expect from you, this is what you can expect from me. Now, that's a win. That's a win. Which means that if we choose to refuse God's expectation to do something else, then we'll not receive what he's offering us in exchange for our obedience. The first expectation that God lets the nation of Israel know that's so applicable to us today is that God expects his children to live by his word. Now, there are lots of things out there we can use to guide and make decisions about the the, the course of our life. But God makes it really clear in this passage that the one rule of thumb we should be living by is His Word. In His Word alone. He said, be careful to obey all the law. All the Word of God is to be obeyed. All of it. We don't get to pick and choose. I mean, certainly there's some parts of the law, there's some parts of expectations of Scripture that are easier for us to accomplish than others. We all have different personalities. We all experience different levels of temptation with different things and topics and ideas and and habits. But we don't get to pick and choose. He said to obey all the law. And then he adds this caveat. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left. What that means is there's going to be opportunities along the way for us to walk away from God's law, to take detours away from God's expectation, to take detours away from the Word of God. And he says, don't do that. God did not put those detours there. That's what we need to understand. As we live the course of life, Satan learns what our uh, most highly valued temptations are and our pet sins and along the way he puts up little markers to get us off track and the longer he can keep us off track and the farther he can get get us off track the less victorious we'll be living and so God says just don't turn don't turn now if you're not going to turn that means you're not even going to look you're not even going to lean you're not even going to glance He says to obey all his word. Now, that's pretty clear. This is like a a no compromise expectation. God says to obey his word, all his word, and don't even look to the right or to the left. We need to understand what this verse is saying. All of us 
are going somewhere with our lives. All of us. Every single one of us are living life in a particular direction. God charts the course for our life, but we get to choose. That's why God says don't turn to the right or to the left. If we did not have a choice to turn right or left, then God wouldn't have said that. But since we have the choice, the, the opportunity to obey all His Word or not obey all His Word, God sets it out pretty clearly. I don't want you choosing anything but my Word. Let this be the course, the guide, the rule for your life. Obey my Word. Obey the Word of God. Now we live traveling in a particular direction. And as we live, we want to be careful about the opportunities to turn right or left. And that makes sense. The question is, will we be successful? Now, success, success comes by listening to this and obeying it. It's unwavering commitment to obedience. It's an unwavering commitment to obedience to God's word. That's God's expectation. Another expectation is that each of us will lead by example. We're not out there living life alone. We're living life interacting with people, with neighbors, with family, with other church members. We learn in chapter 8 that Joshua spent the night with the people. If you read ahead, he stationed soldiers to protect the people and to guard the people. But that night, Joshua went into the valley and slept where the people slept, in the valley. Now Joshua must have loved his people. He could have stayed up on the hillside. He could have slept in his own tent away from everyone else. But he didn't consider himself better or, or greater. Joshua was the kind of leader that led from among the people. He wasn't the kind of person who sat on a distant uh, palace or, or in a safe position. He stayed the night with the people where they stayed. Now, Joshua was about to conquer, the nation of Israel was about to conquer a sloppy world. A lot of pagan practices, a lot of pagan worship, a lot of false gods that they would have to conquer in cities that they would have to conquer and interact with on their journey to, to claim the promised land. Now, I'm going to tell you, our world is just as sloppy. I mean, our world today is, is a mess. But even though our world is a mess, even though the world was a mess back then, God still expects us to keep ourselves pure from this world slop. He expects us to live differently. In a couple of chapters, in Joshua chapter 3, Joshua tells the people to consecrate themselves because God is getting ready to do an amazing thing among the people. The key to seeing the amazing, the key to, to victory, is setting ourselves apart. We have to be different people. God's teaching us how to set ourselves up for success. And part of that success comes from living differently. You're familiar with the passage, to be in the world but not of the world. I mean, we live on this planet where most people are lost. Where most people live wicked lives. I read this morning in uh, Genesis chapter 18 in my quiet time that God went to visit Abraham to tell Abraham on his way to Sodom and Gomorrah, to tell Abraham, hey, this time next year, you're going to have a son by your wife, Sarah. And I want you to name him Isaac. And Isaac means he laughs, or laughter, because Sarah was laughing in the tent. She could overhear the conversation. She was 90 years old. She's like, <laughs> I'm not going to have a baby. But God was on his way to Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis chapter 18. And he has a conversation with two angels that are with him, and asks the question, should we tell Abraham what we're about to do? that we're going to go down there and just destroy this city. Stephanie, in her quiet time, read out of Matthew's Gospel yesterday about the wheat and the tares. And she made an observation that, that a question that I asked, why doesn't God just judge the world now? And why do wicked people seem to prosper? And in her observation of the wheat and the tares, the wheat and the tares are growing up together. In Matthew's Gospel, you're familiar with that story. And that they ask the question, do we try to tear out the, the, the weeds from the wheat? And Jesus said, no, wait till the harvest. Because if you try to pull the weeds up now, you're going to tear out the good wheat and hurt the innocent. 
And so Sevi's observation was, maybe God's withholding judgment on this world because, for the sake of the innocent. That there's so, many, there's so much wicked that has grown up among the righteous that if God was to go to sweep out the wicked, that he would harm the righteous in that judgment. When I read in Genesis chapter 18 this morning about God's pending judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham negotiates with God. God, will you hold back if there's 50? 40, 30, down to 10. And God said, if there's 10, I won't destroy the city. I think this is a biblical principle. That God doesn't want to harm the righteous. Because that really was an example of the wheat and the tares. If he found 10 righteous among all the weeds, then I'm not going to destroy the city for the sake of of the righteous, which is the wheat and the tares in Matthew's gospel. For us, what we have to understand is we live in a sloppy world. You work with sloppy people. Some of us live with sloppy people. We drive next to sloppy people. This is a fallen, wicked world. But don't get dirty while you're living here. We are to be a different people. And God is telling us the expectation that each of us are to live by his word and to be a clean people. Another expectation that God is teaching us is that we're to have his words on our lips every day. Now, the only way that that can happen is if you're reading and thinking about in God's word daily, even deeply daily. That's what it means to meditate. To meditate... If you just read scripture, if it kind of like goes in one ear and out the other, that's not meditating. And it's never going to get on our lips every day. If, it's going to, if we're going to have the word of God on our lips every day, then God is giving us the expectation that we are to spend time in his word every day. Every day. Then we can anticipate his response. And God promises that if we're careful to obey his word, then we'll be prosperous and we'll be successful. And that's how you define victory. And so these verses 7 through 9, it's not some kind of great rocket science. It's really quite practical. It's something that we can do. And all of this sounds like victory to me, even in this sloppy world in which we live. And we live in a world that is scary sometimes. I mean, there's threats, there's political upheavals in our nation and around the world, there's wars, there's viruses that we've never heard of before. I mean, the list goes on of all the things that can frighten us. But God gives a command in this passage that's related to our emotional state, the idea of fear. God commands in this passage, and he says, have I not commanded you, in verse 9, well, God's command, his expectation for his children is that we be strong and courageous. He asked the question, have I not commanded you? And yes, that's a rhetorical question because God has already made the command. My command to you, my expectation of you is that you be a strong person and that you be a courageous person. But also that you as a group of people, you be a strong people and you be a courageous people in the face of whatever comes because in the end, it doesn't matter what's coming. I'm with you always. So be strong and be courageous. Now, these are really two different ideas. The point is that a strong person can withstand a lot of things. And this word strong and its structure is found 41 times in the Old Testament. And this word strong is a particular kind of strength. The, 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 the intriguing part of the word strong, it, mean, it means to make firm means to strengthen, to secure, to harden. And that sounds like physical strength. But that's not, this word strength is not about physical strength. Now the word for physical strength is used many times in Scripture. But this kind of strength here in verse 9 is only used 41 times in the Old Testament. And it's not talking about making our bodies strong. This word strength is about making our minds strong. The thinking part of us. 
What I think God is trying to tell us is that the force of our strength is God's children begins with our thinking. That we're thinking about what it means to be his child. That we're thinking about his word. That we're thinking about not turning to the right or to the left. That we're thinking about being obedient and pure children. That we're thinking about these things. And as we're thinking about it, we're also thinking that it doesn't matter where I go in life, God's with me. That's the last part of verse 9. Did you know it doesn't matter what you experience in life, God's with you. It might be joy, it might be sorrow, it might even be death. But as his child, there's never a time in your life that he's not with you. Even if you're sinning. Because it says, scripture says we can't be snatched from the hand of God. We're sealed in behind and before Now, that's not a license to sin because we've certainly read that we should be a different kind of people even in this sloppy world. Our thinking does more than just make us feel strong. Our way of thinking literally strengthens the internal fortitude of the person. Our thinking can either make us weak on the inside or our thinking can make us strong on the inside. And we'll be strengthened to persist and to prove that we're alert to the world and to God's hand upon us. Now, the spiritually strong will be able to rely upon their strength because it comes from God. It's not a self-manifest strength. It's a strength that comes to us from God as we place our minds upon it. It's Romans 12, 1. I beseech you in the King James, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of the living God. And then he goes on to say, to renew your minds. It's in our thinking. We'll be more spiritually agile and able to escape Satan's attack. And and this is a, a remarkable description of wisdom. He says to be strong, be wise in your thinking. And we're powerful warriors able to carry out our duties as God's child. But we must always remember that our mental and emotional strength comes from God and His Word. That's why right out of the gate, God lets us know we've got to be obeying all of his word, not picking and choosing. That word courageous. God said to be strong, and then he said to be courageous. You know, there's a kind of courage that only a Christian possesses. Christian courage. Christian courage is the willingness to say the right thing, or to do the right thing, regardless of the earthly cost. And that's the kind of courage that God is talking about when he tells Joshua to be of courage. Joshua, do the right thing. Do the right thing every time. Teach your nation to do the right thing every time, regardless of the earthly cost. Do what's right. Say what's right, regardless of what the outcome might be. Why? Because God promises to help us and to save us on account of Christ today. Now, sometimes it it takes a tremendous act of courage to do the right thing. And sometimes doing the right thing can be painful. Sometimes in doing the right thing, there could be some personal injury. The nation of Israel did the right thing when they marched around the wall, around Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. They did the right thing after getting rid of Achan's sin and going back to battle Ai. But you know, when you're fighting, as you're trying to, to wound someone, they're also trying to wound you. Sometimes doing the right thing can be painful. It can be scary. Sometimes the most courageous thing for us to do is the right thing because we demonstrate a level of Christian courage that's uncommon. It's something only Christians have. We have to understand what God is saying here. He's letting us know that courage, Christian courage, is indispensable. Now, there's a kind of cowardice that tells only the truths that are safe to tell now that we're doing facebook live we had to i got to be careful about what i say now not because i'm a 
afraid to preach the truth. We're still going to preach against sin. We're going to preach the Word of God, the, the whole counsel of the Word of God. But I'm going to be careful about my illustrations. Whenever we were doing the, the, the delayed recording, the delayed broadcast, Charles could go in and take out. I said, can you take that out? And he'd go in there and take that out. I can't do that now. But I can tell you, the truth about the Word of God is not going to change. We're going to preach against sin. We're going to preach for righteousness and that Christians ought to be living different kind of lives and impacting this world and leading the lost to Christ, as many as we can. To be like Paul, be all things to all people so that a few might be saved. There's a particular kind of cowardice that does ministry that's only safe to do. Now, coronavirus changed the way we do ministry. I mean, we have one Sunday school class now. I'm grateful we're still having Sunday school. But all the things I had mentioned, all our other ministries came to a screeching halt in the middle of February. I mean, it just, I mean, we had a staff meeting and deacons meetings and church council meetings, but we all agreed we need to put on the brakes to see what we're dealing with. We didn't stop preaching. We found ways to preach. We didn't stop worshiping. We found ways to tell the word of God and to proclaim Jesus Christ regardless of the world around us. But I'm looking forward to the day when we can open the gates. And when the gates open, I hope that we don't look for safe ministries. That we run to the lost. That we run to the broken. Because they need Jesus. There's a kind of cowardice that ventures only do where the battle will be certain in victory. But there's also a kind of courage. A kind of courage that says, I'm going to do it because God's word says do it, regardless of the outcome. I'm going to go regardless of the outcome because God's word says go. Folks, that's courage. That's courage. And our courage is proven in battle. If you want to know what kind of courage you have, Go to the hard places. Do the hard things because your level of courage will be immediately revealed to you. And I want us to be people of courage, simply taking God at His word. Now, God tells us not to be afraid and not to become discouraged in this passage. And there are things and situations and circumstances that can cause us to fear. This word fear in the Hebrew carries with it the idea of being hit so hard by fear that it shakes us to the core, kind of like an earthquake. And it's not a fear where somebody walks around the corner and says, boo. It's the kind of fear like when you're sitting in a doctor's office and you hear something that you didn't want to hear, and it's a fear that shakes you all the way down. Or you get a, your phone typically doesn't ring at 1030 at night, but it, you get a phone call at 1030 and you recognize the name on the caller ID. It's that kind of fear that just hits you all of a sudden. And it shakes you to the very core. God is saying, this word fear in the Hebrew is that kind of fear. The kind of fear that's like an earthquake in your life. God says, listen, for the child of God, there are no earthquakes like that. There's not any. He says, do not be afraid. Don't be fearful people. Because in reality, you're untouchable. God is with you wherever you go. By claiming these promises, by living these promises, this year can be a year of victory for you, for our church. And I'm excited what lies ahead. We began this series of sermons reflecting upon what, when God told Joshua to collect 12 memory stones. And they went back out of that dry riverbed where the priests stood and dug up those 12 stones and heaved them upon their shoulders. You know, memories fade. We'll forget about this virus, probably. We'll forget about how it changed our life, our worship, our home, our everything about life. But we must keep the memory of God's provision fresh. And that's where we begin this sermon series. Here's the beauty of Joshua's story. We get to read in chapter 1, God talking with Joshua in his tent. Joshua, this is my message to you. Take it to my people. You know, Joshua did. By the end of Joshua's life, thank God for chapter 24. By the end of Joshua's life, 
there was not one child of God, not one Israelite that forsook God. And the other side of that is God kept every promise. Every promise that he made to Joshua and those people in verses 7 through 9, God kept every promise. And he could because they knew the expectations and they obeyed. God protected them the entire journey. This account of Joshua is a wonderful account of God's deliverance and preparation for his children. It's your story. You're the Joshua. This is God telling you. Here's how you have victory in your life. Find yourself in this story. God gives us accounts like this because we learn his expectations of us, but we also learn about what we can expect from him. You're God's child if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and God has called us to go to new places, do new things, places we've never been before, to to connect with people we've never connected with. To do that, we must never lose the memory of God's promises. As Brandon comes to lead us in a hymn of decision, I challenge you to to let this year be your year of victory. Let this year be like no other year you've ever had. And let it be the beginning for victory for all the years of your life. Claim God's promises and live obediently to Him alone. Let's stand together as we sing. If you have a spiritual decision to make, you, or if you just like to pray, I invite you to come and to pray here. We've got some places designated where you can, can pray while social distancing. Let's sing together.
good stuff right there. I tell you what, I, the Word of God is alive and well and so instructive for us. I'm grateful that God doesn't hide things. He makes it just as plain as the nose on our face. Go claim your victory this year, this year and all the years. I'm grateful that we were to here together with us. Remember, we are, we are back worshiping on Wednesday, so if you feel comfortable being in person, come join us. If not, we're doing Facebook Live. Uh, we probably will for uh, now on, I guess. Got such a, a good response to it. But anyway, God bless you. Let's give uh, Brandon a hand clap of blessing. <laughs> grateful for him and his ministry, and it's certainly been a blessing to us uh, the last three weeks. Brandon, will you close us in prayer? Father, thank you so much for this day, for the time we've had in your house this morning. We pray that our worship has been pleasing and acceptable uh, to you. We thank you for the word that was brought and for uh, the clarity of Scripture, uh, telling us to be strong and courageous. We pray that you would empower us to do so this week and that you would bring us back at the next appointed time. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.